talks about making friends. Um, yeah, but they're all for little kids. Hmm. I assume the skills can be extrapolated and transferred. Uh, I guess they're right over there by the wooden train set. Oh, I love trains. <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> oh, my, that's awfully sticky. <laughs> all right, let's see. Bernie Bunny has two daddies now. It's probably about homosexual rabbits. <laughs> Jerry the gerbil and the bullies on the bus. Reddit not helpful. <laughs> oh. Well, here we go. Stu the cockatoo is new at the zoo. <laughs> Author Sarah Carpenter lives in Fort Wayne, Indiana, with her husband and best friend Mark. And they're cockatoo stew. Hardly makes her an expert in making friends, wouldn't you agree? I don't like birds. They scare me. Me too. Most people don't see it. <laughs> what are you reading? Curious George. Oh, I do like monkeys. Curious George's monkey. Somewhat anthropomorphized, but yes. <laughs> Say. Maybe sometime you and I could go see monkeys together. Would you like that? Okay. Sheldon, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm making friends with this little girl. What's your name? Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. I'm your new friend, Sheldon. No, you're not. Let's go. <laughs> we were really hitting it off. Uh, don't look up those cameras. <laughs> All right, so why is it don't look up those cameras? Why is that there? Yeah, Maroni. Because you don't want to get ID'd after what he just did, right? Um, talking to that little girl, what's his intention? Just to be friends. And if you watch the show, he's an asexual person generally. He's just not into that kind of thing. Doesn't even think about that kind of stuff. And yet, to the outside, how does this look? Yes, like he's got a van and a puppy and candy. He's a predator, right? I have seen more adults go to jail autistic adults go to jail for sexual issues than for anything else. In fact, almost exclusively sexual issues. And a lot of times, it's these kinds of misunderstandings. Okay, true story. I got a call from a lawyer a few years ago where he said, I need you to come and maybe help testify in a case. I'm like, well, what are you talking about? I've never done that before. And he said, well, let me explain. My client is a married adult with autism. He's in his 20s, had no kids. Um, but he played this video game online all the time. And in the course of this online video game, he came across this other player. And this other player told him that she was a 13-year-old girl. And it was cool. He just kept playing. But this girl kept talking about stuff that just seemed really kind of sexual and kind of dangerous. And he, being, you know, a good person, decided that, oh my gosh, somebody needs to help this little girl. And it turns out she lives in Utah. I am going to go meet this girl and I'm going to help her and, and get her on the right track because she's probably in a lot of danger talking about all this sexual stuff. Guess who was there to meet him when he went to go meet this 13-year-old girl? The police, because the 13-year-old girls you meet online are generally police. And so the police officers weren't interested in his story. They didn't believe his, his side of it at all. And honestly, the, he was coming from that sincere place of, I just really want to help this girl. And thankfully, we were able to petition the judge, and they bargained it down to time served, um, where he didn't have to go to jail, and he was able to get off. But that doesn't always happen, okay? I, I have former students that are currently in jail, and I have students that have come out of jail for misunderstandings um, who now can't get an apartment because they're on the sex offenders list, and they can't get a job because they're on the sex offenders list, and they can't get a date because they're on the sex offenders list. And it's really sad, sad, sad stuff. Um, so we're going to talk a little about the safety things. We're going to talk a lot about relationships and systems for that too. Because sexuality, again, we're all adults, right? And if we make poor decisions about sexuality, it can mess things up. But if we're making good decisions about sexuality, sexuality can be a wonderful thing, right? Guess what the most overlooked area of transition is? By golly, it's number six there, right? Nobody talks about sex. And in fact... The real scandal is this. Guess when we actually get any kind of sex ed, generally, as autistic people? 
after we've messed up, <laughs> after we're in trouble, after there's an issue. Um, so what we don't know can hurt us. And there's a ton of myths, right? Oh, people on the spectrum, they don't care about sex, or they're always hyper fixated on it, or they're always heterosexual, or they're always LGBT, or sex ed's just gonna give them ideas, they can't understand it, and I love this one. If we don't give them any information about sexuality, they'll never develop sexually, right, of course. Um, or, oh, if they have sexual issues as a kid, they're always gonna grow up to be sex offenders. Guess what, over 98% of those who have sexual problems as kids do not grow up to be sex offenders. People with autism shouldn't date. They're never gonna have a successful marriage, so we shouldn't even talk about that stuff. Again, I've been married 21 years. Um, and I know a lot of people with autism with successful marriages. The truth is, we're people. And autistic people have the same hormones. We have the same, we're exposed to the same media. We obsessed about the same Disney movies when we were kids, right? <laughs> How does every Disney movie end? <laughs> the princess marries that prince and it's all great. The bottom line is our interests vary widely across the spectrum. But if you look at the stats, what little research has been done, there's no separate set of dreams. How many people in here are hoping at some point to be in a really serious long-term relationship like marriage or something? Okay. We have the same kinds of dreams. How many people in here want to have kids someday or already have kids? Or, okay. Yeah, it, truth is, we tend to have slight delays. We tend to be a little more likely to be asexual or on the LGBT spectrum. But even though we have these delays, how is the world going to look at us? Our inside age or our outside age? Outside age, right? And so we've got to take care of this stuff and we've got to understand that we're going at this topic with a huge deficit in knowledge compared to our peers. Where do neurotypicals get all their information about sex? Anybody know what the number one place that they get their information is? It's from their friends. They talk to their friends about this stuff and that's where they get it. Guess where the number one place is people with autism get information about sex? The internet. Guess what the absolute worst possible place to get information about sex is? The internet, generally. There's a couple good sites in your, in your handouts. The truth is, whether you are like, yes, I absolutely want to learn about this, or oh, this makes me so uncomfortable, the decisions that we make about sexuality are going to have a massive impact on our lives, our jobs, our long-term happiness. And just as we are all unique, right? You met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Our relationships are also going to be, right? Sexual or otherwise. How many of you guys have seen Autism in Love, the documentary? It's really cool, it was free on Netflix forever. It might still be back, it might still be on there. Last time I checked it had been taken off but it goes back on from time to time. This is the trailer for Autism in Love and it shows you um, several different individuals on the spectrum, all of whom struggle through their relationships in the documentary. And it's a really cool documentary um, but I think it makes some cool points about the uniqueness of it all. I always knew I was different, but I didn't really understand why, why I couldn't be accepted. I felt incredibly ashamed of being autistic. Sometimes I tried to pretend I was never autistic because they would kind of laugh at you. I'm single, by the way. I had one girlfriend, but it didn't quite work out that well. Yes, I'm in love. What does that mean? I don't know, it means to fall in love, to give a, give a kiss and a hug. Love is a very abstract concept that many people with autism have a hard time grasping. I asked her, how would you feel about being in a relationship with me? She said, I could see if this may, be, this may work. Dave's a meteorologist. What did you think when you first met her? It's nice. It was beautiful. Did you think that he would be capable of a romantic relationship? No, I didn't dare hope. You know, I want want an independent girl, but I feel like I can't. If I found a girl that had a job, had a car, had her whole home, I can't be with her. Look, they're up here. I'm down here. Wearing the jewelry kind of makes me feel that sort of false sense of confidence, and it kind of makes me feel less vulnerable. 
Well, it looks like the weather just came out. I was going to catch a, a, a glimpse here. <clears throat> We're so fixated on our comfort zones. It's sometimes difficult to communicate. I gave Gita a hug. I put my arms around her. Whether someone years. can love you without truly understanding you, I think it's absolutely possible. I love it when she holds me, hugs me, kisses me, smiles at me. Love is neither visible, measurable. There's no way to quantify it. And what's in here? It's in here. It always will be. How do you know when you're in love? I don't know. Anyway, it's a really good documentary, and it you know shows some cool things. We'll come back and see Dave and Lindsay again here, but we'll talk about them as well. Your uniqueness means that your relationships are also going to be unique. But no matter what your situation, you need certain amounts of information. You need to know your personal values when it comes to everything, but especially sexuality. Social competencies and social skills. You need to work to discover your personal identity, sexual and otherwise. And you need to practice safety because the other thing I see over and over and over again is the people, you guys are here and you're learning about this stuff and it's going to help you in a lot of ways. A lot of the people on the spectrum who don't want to talk about this stuff, they're going to end up with these safety issues. And that's sad because the research says that we're twice as likely to get busted for harassment or to be stalkers or to be to get addicted to porn or involved with child porn or to get arrested for public sexual behaviors or to become victims of sexual abuse. Um, it's really kind of sad. So you need to know your vulnerabilities and guard against them. And when you're going off into that dating world, you need to know how to be able to protect yourself. And we'll talk about some of those things. Um, but you should know what sexual abuse and assault is. And you should always know it's not your fault. And it's always a crime. And it isn't going to stop you from having the relationships that you want. But the big scandal is this, too. We are most vulnerable from, not strangers, we're most vulnerable from our caregivers and those people that we're involved with dating and so forth. Why is sexuality a big problem for autism? Well, because autism has language and communication problems. And relationships, especially intimate relationships, require a lot of language and communication, right? We have social deficits and environmental deficits. So often, we don't have a lot of dating opportunities, right? It's like, well, we're stuck here or we're isolated and so how am I even supposed to find people? Difficulties with public, private, reality, fantasy, maintaining and generalizing learned skills. Um, I had a former student who uh, she learned all of the ways to protect herself here, and then she went out, got herself an apartment. She's kind of clumsy. She fell down and hurt her arm one time, and she's wearing a sling, and she's got all these groceries, and this guy comes up to her in the parking lot of her apartment building and is like, oh, let me help you carry those up to your apartment. And she was like, sure. And she'd been through all of our training. What should she have told him? No, thanks, I've got this, because she doesn't know him. He goes up to her apartment. He refuses to leave. She ended up sexually assaulted. Um, Luckily, she knew what to do afterward. She at least had that. But again, that's a problem too. Um, and of course, we can have issues related to police officers and so forth. When they survey people with autism, we talk about how, well, we have negative body image or we don't even identify with our bodies very well. Um, we have troubles with social emotional regulation and with reading other people's emotions. We have a lack of experience or even opportunities for experience. And we also have a lot of things like anxiety and depression that come along with autism that can create issues. Um, we have struggles reading other people's faces, which makes us kind of a sitting duck for being taken advantage of, right? We uh, often have sexual abuse in our family history. Our developmental delays mean that we may be more aligned with kids. Sheldon asking this little girl to go see monkeys? Well, that's exactly where he's at socially, but does, that's not how the world's gonna look at it, right? Social rules are difficult for us to master, and we'll talk more about that when we talk about harassment, but we also tend to be really lonely. And when we're really lonely, we can get pretty desperate sometimes. The big reasons, well, sometimes the only time we feel normal is having sex. The other big reasons, sometimes nobody talked to us about this at all. And so we have a lot of ignorance and shame and fear built up around sexual topics. Bottom line is though, you can't get rid of the fact that we're sexual beings, we're born that way, so we need to 
have that information, clarify our values, and gain the social skills, safety skills, and identity skills we need to navigate adulthood. Um, this is just the kind of the curriculum for our healthy sexuality class. I'm not going to go through all these, but number one there, why do you need to know slang terms for body parts? Why would that be important? So you know what other people are talking about. Like, we, I always encourage people to use proper names for things. But we can get ourselves into big trouble not knowing slang names, right? Anybody catch the double entendre in that Sheldon clip there from Big Bang? As he's talking to this little girl about, let's go see monkeys. Okay, the monkey is a slang term for a male body part. And so it's even worse. And it looks even worse there when um, he's talking. Uh, let's look at a couple of these, though. Oh, and even once you've got the basic curriculum down, we need other skills, right? Like the advanced skills. Like the flirting academy. All right, academy. everyone, first things first. Let's talk about you. You are all here because you struggle with flirting, okay? <laughs> so, what we're... Oh, yes, Jeremy? Um, I sometimes cry around beautiful women. Is that normal? <laughs> ah, yes, we will talk about that. Yes. Well, most of you are uh, very successful, smart, attractive people, but flirting is not your strong suit. So, Stephen, why don't you stand up and tell us about yourself, okay? Hi, I'm Stephen. I'm partner at one of the big law firms in town. I also love soccer. I played a few years in college. So. All right. And Mallory, why don't you do the same? Tell us about yourself. Okay. Um, I'm Mallory. I'm the head editor at a publishing company down the road, and um, I also play the violin in the city orchestra. Great. Now, you both seem like very socially apt people. So I want you to turn to each other and talk to one another. Good. Hey, hey. Just, just give me a second. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. No. no. Okay. Oh okay, yeah. Okay. Well, um, exhibit A, my friends. <laughs> Flirting does not come naturally to us all. <laughs> Some of us are born flirtatious right from the womb. <laughs> and, um, you know, some of us are better at algebra or whittling or grave digging. It's another one. But you know what? There is hope, my friends. You just have to stick to the basic principles. Okay, so today we're going to work on ice breaking, breaking that ice, all right? So we're going to start with the first time that you see somebody. So everybody stand up on your feet, okay? I won't up, make up, you up. do this. <laughs> But this right, looks a lot like some of our social skills classes. Close your eyes <laughs> and imagine that you're in a crowded club. There's music and dancing, and you see someone from across the room that you'd like to flirt with. He or she is very attractive. <laughs> and suddenly, your eyes meet. Now remember, maintaining eye contact Maintaining eye contact is very crucial in any flirtatious exchange. So what I want you all to do now is open your eyes and show me the face that will say, well, hello, you. Let's get together. Okay, so show, oh, 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 oh. Hands down, Jason, hands down, okay. Matt, Matt, it might help if you were facing the girl that you wanted to talk to. Okay, so, oh, Natalie, hey. Hey there, Natalie, uh, is that your normal face or do you smell something awful? Uh, no, this is my saucy face. <laughs> okay, what face do you make when you do smell something? <laughs> you know what, that's perfect. Why don't we just keep it at that, okay? Oh, yep, okay. okay. Or, oh, Jeremy, Jeremy, you gotta lighten up, okay? They're just women. Okay, have, have a seat, have a seat, okay, buddy? Okay, okay, buddy. See, Stephen, what is, what are you doing? Where did you get those bubbles? What if you don't have bubbles in the crowded club? No, no, I always have bubbles. <laughs> okay, we will discuss that later. Okay, sit down, sit down. Mallory, hey, Mallory. Um, you wanna maybe have a little less rage in your face? You look a little murderous. Okay, maybe uh, mix that rage with surprise. Okay, maybe uh, surprise and fear. Um, surprise and shame. 
Okay, you know, comparatively, that's better. Okay, <laughs> just sit down. Okay, okay. Um, why don't we... we... We don't have time to watch the whole skit. You should look it up. But bottom line, neurotypical struggle with flirting, too. Here's the simple, simple system for flirting. Flirting is not about being all sexy or attractive even necessarily. Flirting is about being fun and playful and relaxed. And the more you can just be fun and playful with the person, the more successful you will be as a flirter, um, whether you want to go on to a romantic relationship or not. Um, but let's look at a few of these. Public-private is one that's pretty important. But what does it mean that the internet is public? Right? Obviously, sexual activities are a private thing, but what does it mean the internet is public? Why is that? What happens to everything that you put on the internet? <laughs> it stays there and people can see it. Um, and therefore sexting is a really bad idea. And yet a lot of, if I would say most younger people do it. Um, one of my favorite students, we were in class and when we were talking about this, and we were talking about sexting, which is sending sexually explicit pictures to somebody, right? And this girl, she's like, wait, is that what that is? I had this guy that asked me for pictures, and I was like, pictures? What kind of pics? I don't know what he's wanting pictures of. So I was like, you know what? I like pancakes. I'll send him a stack of pancakes. So she sent him a picture of a stack of pancakes. She's like, and he never texted me again. And I was like, you, that was perfect. Every time someone asks you for pics, you send him a stack of pancakes. That was awesome. Um, but just know that when you're talking to people online, um, are they who they say they are? If you're even accidentally looking at Pornographic pictures, especially of kids, they can stay on your computer and get you busted, regardless of whether you even saw it. Um, and in the words of our 16th president, right? Don't believe everything you read on the internet. Because um, you only know what the other person wants you to know. And the people who are bad online, they're good at this. They know exactly what you want to hear. Be careful who you give your information out to. Don't sext, we just talked about that. It's okay to meet people online. We'll talk about internet dating in a second, but... When you go to meet that person that you've met online, always go to a public place and transport yourself there. Why? So you can leave. So I had this girl that I was working with, and she's like, oh, I met this guy online. He seems so great. We're going on a date tonight. I said, that's wonderful. What are you doing? I don't know actually what we're doing, but he's coming to pick me up in his truck, and we're going to go on a date. And I'm like, okay, let's, let's back this up and really talk about this here. Um, don't look for sex partners online. I had to add that line because a lot of times people with autism, they're like, well, I get everything else online. Why not get a sex partner online? What is the problem with looking for sex partners online? You can get yourself in trouble really quick. And what was this? The other people are looking online. Yeah, those other people are online for a reason there. And a lot of times you're going to get yourself in trouble. Boundaries, again, different behaviors, different touch. It all depends on what level this is and where that person is on this. Um, and when you're trying to build a relationship, you've got to be careful not to jump boundaries or levels on the friendship hierarchy, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, it gets really easy to accidentally do that. Let's talk about personal values, right? The number one thing you can do to improve your personal happiness in relationships and anything else, your job, your school, whatever, is to know your values and live them. What, is, what are the most important ways of being and believing? What do you expect of your best self? What do you want in a friend or a spouse or a sexual partner? And if you know your values, you're going to make better decisions about your job, about your friendships, your relationships. And if you don't, you're going to be at the mercy of the other person's values. You should be looking for people with similar values to you, and you should be respecting people with different values, but you need to know your values. So there's a values clarification exercise, I think referenced in the uh, handout. If not, email me, I'll send you one or two. Um, they're all over the internet as well. But really, it's a matter of asking questions, right? To say, what is most important to me? Let's talk about sexual identity for a second. First of all, sexual identity is not our whole identity, right? What are some other aspects of identity, some other things we use to define ourselves and who we are? What are some other things you can use beyond just sexuality for that? What are some other aspects of our personhood? Yeah. Good, your education. What was your degree in? And what do you like studying about? Good. What else defines us? Yeah. Our interests define us. Good. What else makes us unique in ourselves? Right? Our geography, our age, our race, our ethnicity, our religion, all of these things matter. Now, sexual identity is important, right? It is a combination of your biology and genetics, 
your attraction patterns, your situations, and the values that you have. Um, but often I find that even though we have to be aware of things like sexual orientation and gender identity and all that kind of stuff, we don't need to rush into this. Autism is a developmental delay. And so one of the things I want to emphasize is that if you're like, oh, I don't even know my sexual identity or I want to jump into a sexual identity, it's like, take your time. It is all right to take your time to figure this one out, just like any other aspect of your identity. Just like when you first get out of high school, you're like, often don't know what you want to do for your career or for your education. It's okay to get out and not know all about your sexual identity. It will come, don't worry. We talked about this briefly when we talked about employment last hour, but what is the difference between flirting and sexual harassment? Yeah. Okay, so inappropriate touching definitely becomes um, not, just in, not just harassment, then that can become assault. Um, but what's the difference between harassment and flirting? Yeah. Good, did you guys hear this? Flirting is wanted and invited, so harassment is not. So one thing I've often seen people with autism do that has lost them a job is that they're like, well, okay, so these guys, I saw this guy talking to this girl in the office and he was telling her this and this and this and using these words and he told her she looked gorgeous and she was all laughing and giggling and it was great. So I went and told her the same things and she went to HR and reported me. Well, why? Because fair or not, it has to do with whether or not it's welcome or unwelcome. So anything that might create an intimidating, hostile or offensive work environment, you want to avoid. Stalking, again, one of the best things you can do as a person with autism is not get fixated on a single person as like, this is the only person I could ever have a relationship with. Um, so what you want to do is make sure you're around lots of other people. Don't isolate. Um, make sure that you have more opportunities for social integration. You can even seek therapy if you need to. But most stalkers who get arrested are autistic. And that's really sad. That's not a statistic we should necessarily be proud of. But why? because we get so hyper-focused and perseverative. Just because in our minds, we want a relationship at a certain level doesn't mean the other person's there. One of the biggest focuses when it comes to harassment and stalking is consent. What is consent? What does consent mean? Permission, right? Any time that you want to have any kind of relationship with somebody, sexual or not, you need their permission for these relationships because relationships can never be just on one side. And so along the way, as you're talking with people, make sure you're like, oh, is this okay? And you check things all the way. And consent is definitely a piece of that, right? Remember that no means no. In the movies, when two people meet in a romantic movie, generally what happens in that first scene, how do they feel about each other? They hate each other, all the girls are saying. They know this because they've watched all these romantic comedies. In all of these romantic movies, generally first scene, the guy and the girl, they hate each other. They're just like, oh, that person, they're the worst in the world. And it's all no, 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 no. But by the end of the movie, they've all you know, made up and hooked up, right? This is now they're happily ever after. In real life, if people respond really negatively to you at first, is it probably going to become a yes? No. So remember that no means no. When someone tells you no, you need to take that very seriously. The other thing you need to do is remember that it's okay to say no. And this is especially for girls, but also the guys in here. A lot of us have been conditioned as kids with autism through behaviorism and everything else and all of the, the wonderful things we've gone through with public schooling. What have we been conditioned to do? When somebody asks us to do something, we comply, right? We say yes, but it's okay to say no, and especially when it comes to things. Now, we may be so desperate for a relationship that we're like, oh, I'm finally with this person, and they'll dump me if I don't do X, Y, or Z sexually. It's okay to say no. Be true to yourself and your values. You'll be a lot happier, and you'll find somebody who's better suited for you. A lot of times with autism, our brains will get locked onto sexual thinking um, or anxious thinking. Neither of those things are super helpful. So if you're having unwanted or unhelpful thoughts, this is a system from the book Brain Lock. It actually works really well. It's got good research behind it. And it's pretty simple. First of all, when those unwanted, unhelpful thoughts come, you say, wait a minute. <laughs> These are unwanted, unhelpful thoughts. So you label them for what they are. And then you say, okay, that doesn't make me a bad person. This just means I've got this, this glitch. I'm perseverating or I'm addicted or whatever. And then as soon as you recognize that, you say, okay, I got a whole list of things I can do instead. Things that will involve me mentally and physically and get away from whatever that situation is. 
And over time, your brain actually rewires and is able to revalue this. And so if you feel like I'm hopeless because I've got a porn addiction or I'm hopeless because I'm always thinking violent thoughts or I'm hopeless because I've always got this anxious mindset and I just see myself failing, you're not hopeless. You can get through that stuff. You can have new thought processes that will be much more positive, but you're gonna need to work on it. Just don't shame, no shame. If you are having a porn addiction, there's 12-step programs, there's therapies out there, there's a lot of issues with that. Um, but one of the cool things about autism is our brains are very all or nothing. And so if you, although we can become addicted pretty quickly to things, whether it's drugs or video games or, or sex or porn, we can also cut that off generally cold turkey pretty well. Another system, as we're trying to have relationships, they all circle around friendships, right? But are all friends the same? No, right? There's different levels of friendship. And so when we're talking about relationships, we're not talking about these levels, right? The acknowledgement level, that's just somebody where you're like kind of nodding, you know, you're in an elevator together, you're waiting for a bus together, you're at the grocery market. Acquaintance is somebody you know their name and a little bit about them. This comrade level, this C level here, these are the people you have to spend time with, right? Because you're in a class together, you're at church together, you're in a club together, you're coworkers, it's that C level. What is the difference between this level and the friend level? What makes the difference? When does someone stop being that comrade level and move into friend? What has to happen? Choice. You have to choose to spend time together outside of this structured activity, right? Because here, you're kind of forced to be together. But the second that they want to spend time together with you outside of that, now you've moved over to friends. Now are there levels of friend? Of course there are. And where is dating and, and, and romantic relationships? Where would that be on this pyramid? Hopefully toward the top, right? <laughs> so again, know that someone wants to be a friend and look for healthy relationships. As you're looking at people to move up to those romantic relationships, you wanna have these characteristics. It's in your handout. It's only in this order, so it spells healthy, right? But you need honesty. If the person's lying, that's a big red flag. You need to look for equality and fairness. Are you always the one that's doing things or paying for things? You need to look for appropriate time. Um, is this appropriate time for this relationship? I had a student who came to me, he was so excited. He was like, I finally got this girl to say yes, we're going on a date this weekend. I said, wonderful, what are you doing? And he's like, well, I'm gonna pick her up at three o'clock and then we're going out over to Sundance and we're gonna ride the ski lift up and back. And then after that, I'm gonna take her to a movie and after the movie, we're gonna go to dinner and it's gonna be great. I was like, this is the first date? And he's like, yeah. What are you gonna to talk to her about on the ski lift ride? You're not even, you don't like talking to girls. You get uncomfortable really quick. That's a 45 minute ride. I, I don't know. <laughs> and just, what movie are you going to? Well, I don't know. What movies does she like? Well, I don't know what kind of movies she likes. So we, we what is an appropriate first date? One with a lot of exits. Sitting together on a ski lift for, for 45 minutes is not exits. Good, I like that. How long should a first date be? It depends, right? But it shouldn't be super long. Um, usually, about, if it's a first date, it should be about one hour plus whatever little activity. So if you watch a movie and then like an hour, great. Um, go out to dinner and an hour, great. But again, appropriate time. If the relationship is getting higher, it should have more time, right? You need loving support where they're actually like saying they believe in you and that they're able to help you and they can even do things like maybe help you move which is like a true test of friendship, right? Double-sided respect. Both of you need to respect each other and what you believe. Hardcore communication skills means the skills to talk about not just the simple things, but the really difficult subjects. And total trust. You need to know that this person's not gonna betray you behind your back or anything else. Again, you're looking for as many of these on the highest level you can, and that's a healthy relationship. So if you're finding that you've got a healthy relationship and it's building and you're spending time together outside there, then you want to start maybe moving them up into that intimate friend. And when we're talking about sex and romance, you know, that's, those are there. But this is also your best friends, right? People you want to spend a lot of time with one-on-one -on -one and so forth. How do you know that you really have somebody there? Well, both of you have those feelings. Both of you are saying that you want to spend time one-on-one, -on -one, that you want to date. And again, there's levels of this. Dating is not the same as going steady. is not the same as engaged. But wherever we want them to be, if we want to date this person, that's great. Is it up to our level? It's gotta be their level too. A lot of times, those of us with autism, we're like, hey, I just met this person and they seem really nice. Boom, I wanna jump you right up to here, right? 
now we can get married and have children and live together happily ever after. And it's like, no, unfortunately, you have to go where they are and gradually help them move up. And if they don't move up, that's okay. They can still be friends or they can still be comrades. But if they don't get here, that's fine. You move on to somebody else. All right. As we're doing this, we should avoid celebrity syndrome. What is celebrity syndrome? What do we often want people to look like? <laughs> the people we see in magazines and on movies and in TV, right? By the way, those who are especially addicted to porn, this becomes a problem because people expect people to look like they look in pornography, which is not, not at all how people look. Take things slowly and respectfully. Share positive experiences. I've literally seen people with autism walk up and this is their like opening line. It's like, so what medications are you on? And it's like, oh, that's probably not where you wanted to begin. Model and expect reciprocity. A relationship is like a tennis match, right? You're not going back and forth and back and forth. Um, if you do something, they should do something back. And if not, then that should be an issue. Remember, trust comes before touch. Just because you're on a date with somebody doesn't give you any rights to do anything. You've got to have consent for whatever you're doing. And don't smother, but don't ignore. I was the side that ignored. So in, I went, grew up in Alaska on an island, and there wasn't a lot of guys around. And so I got asked to prom because some girls find the guys who completely ignore them irresistible, I guess. But so I went with this girl who I didn't even really know, and I went to prom, and it was really, it turned out to be a really fun time. She was very nice, very respectful. It was great. We had a good time. I dropped her off at her house, went home, and didn't talk to her for two weeks because prom is over, right? And of course, what I hear through the grapevine is she's a mess. She thinks that I, you know, I'm this terrible person and all this stuff. So I had to, to try and repair that. But no one likes the other extreme either, right? This is a true story. So guy with autism, he has a job, he's living on his own, he's doing well, he's got a girl that he's been, that's been at work with him, and um, he's been talking to her at work, and she finally agreed to a date. And he shows up at her house, this is not a joke, this is not a lie. First date, he has a limousine he's rented. He's all dressed up in his tuxedo. He didn't know if she liked chocolate or flowers or what, so he got her chocolates and flowers. And he's got a balloon with a teddy bear inside the balloon with more candy inside the teddy bear. And he goes up to the door, knocks on the door, and the girl comes out. And she probably would have just turned and walked back in if she wasn't feeling like really obligated. She came on the date, never spoke to him again afterwards. Why? Because it was too much. Again, thinking of the pyramid, what level would you want to be at? <laughs> What level would it be appropriate to show up in the limo and, and uh, with all that stuff? Right? It'd be way up here. Be a really good, like, be a good proposal, right? But it's not a good first date when you're just trying to just cross this line. So, again, don't overwhelm them, but don't ignore them. And watch for red flags. In your handout, there's a bunch of red flags and green lights. We won't have time to go through them. But they're there to help you see, like, okay, so what's something I should watch out for when that maybe would mean this relationship's not what I want and what would be a green light to say, yeah, I should probably keep going. Yeah, Whitney, did you not get a handout? Here we go. Anybody else not get a handout? Okay, we'll get you some handouts. Um, check your assumptions. I once taught a girl who ended up getting raped by a guy that she went out with because she's like, oh no, it'll be fine. He's a return missionary. And that instant assumption that can come along with that is not helpful. Watch your... Watch for red flags. Another rule, three strikes, they're out. This is a really simple rule. If you have asked somebody on a date three times, and that first time they were like, oh, I would totally go out with you, but I've got another date this weekend. And the second time they're like, oh, I would totally go out with you, but I've got a final. And, and in the third one, they're like, you know, I'm sorry to cancel our date, but my grandmother died. It doesn't matter what they say. If you've had three tries and they're not going out with you, then just let it go. You may have another chance later on, but just stop. Also, if they have three red flags, just even if you're like, oh, but they're so awesome in this other way, if they've got three red flags, stop. And again, look at that. This was my dating system. It worked great for me, but again, you'll need your own systems. The first thing is if you want to date is you got to go where the right people are. Right people depends on your values, right? So if you are not into alcohol, do you go to the clubs to find the people you want to date? No, right? So go where the right people are. Generally, these are where your interest groups are. Go find a group of similar-minded people. Have a plan and a backup plan. So I'd always be like, okay, I'm going to go see Avengers Endgame. Uh, who could I take with me? Who do I know that likes this and this and this? And I'd have a plan. And the backup plan, too. If they were like, oh, I really, I don't have time or I've already seen it. It was like, okay, that's great. I'm go out with this other person or I'll just go myself and that's fine. And it helps you when you have a plan and a backup plan and something you were going to do anyway be able to approach with confidence. 
And you start talking to them, watch for the flags, and decide if you want to ask them out. Then you need to use your anti-anxiety systems. Keep talking to them. Why should they do most of the talking? Why should it be like 60-40? Why should they do most of the talking? What happens when it's the other way? Yeah. People like to hear themselves talk, okay? I'm, I'm living proof of this, but <laughs> they really, you should try and play a game to have them do slightly more than half the talking. Invite with confidence and just expect them like you'd be inviting them to, to borrow a cup of sugar or a pen to work, you know, to do a test with or something. And then if they say yes, thank them, clarify the details and be sure you can follow up. Relax, enjoy yourself and have fun with the process because guess what? Most of the time, what is the answer gonna probably be? Sure, I'll go with you. But those times it's not, that's okay too. And even if they go out with you, What's gonna happen 99 times out of 100 when they go out with you? Most of the time when you go out with somebody, do you end up with them forever? No, in fact, you're gonna go through lots and lots of people. So relax and enjoy yourself, it's there. Um, in the packet, there's this, signs you can look for. These are verbal and nonverbal cues that the person is interested in you. If you're trying to tell that person you're interested in them, you can use these as well. Are they the ones, you know, if the person likes you, they're gonna start conversations with you. They're gonna find you in that crowded room. They're gonna give you positive attention. They're gonna light up when you're around. They may have some playful touch. They're gonna to make more eye contact generally. And they're gonna make positive comments about the future. Hey, you know, I'm going to the game. Are you going? Things like that, right? Now, let's say someone asks you out. You need a system. So here's a simple system where you're asking yourself questions about, do I wanna be in a relationship Is with this person? What level? Do I have the time? Do I have the supports? Is this an appropriate, asking out here. If you're saying yes to this stuff, then yeah, clarify the details and say yes. But if you're feeling no or there's a lot of red flags, you just need to say no thank you. How many people in here really struggle to say no thank you to anybody? <laughs> we like to say yes to people. We need to know systems for saying no thank you, right? And when we say no, we don't have to give them a huge long explanation of everything, right? We don't owe them that. Now, this is for like talking and meeting in person. Where do most dates come from nowadays? Online dating. And in fact, there's more than 2,500 dating sites and over 20% of people now getting married are meeting their spouses online. So it is honestly the best and worst way to date. This is what one of my students told me. They're like, oh, internet dating's the best. Oh, and the worst. What would make it the best? What's good and positive about internet dating? What? It's super convenient. It's right there at the touch of your fingers. What else? What? Right, you can like type things and, and really work on phrasing those words and, 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 and really shaping the picture that they see of you. Although you shouldn't like literally Photoshop the picture that they see of you, right? Okay, but the worst, what makes it the worst? What are the downsides of internet dating? Photoshop, right? Okay. You can, you can get caught in lies pretty easily, right? And they can too. Um, and it's, it's tough, it's, you're not really with that person. It's there. The general idea though is you meet online, you build that relationship and then safely you figure out a way to meet offline. One of the best techniques you can have, because when we get attracted to somebody, our whole like judgment part of our brain shuts off. <laughs> That's what happens with everybody. Um, is get a second pair of eyes. Have someone like a trusted person, a sibling, a parent, a friend, um, a, a therapist, somebody who can look at your dating stuff and be like, is this legit? Are these really the signals I'm getting? Does this really seem safe? Is this appropriate? Remember to be honest and be yourself online. And we're generally pretty picky with autism, right? But we need to also be open. If somebody's really interested in us, it might be worth a first date just to see, well, maybe we will hit it off, who knows? But we do need to be picky. Right? If the person seems like totally out of line with our values, that's not likely. Um, anybody with uh, some personal experience with online dating, some tips that they would share, or some cautions that they would share? <laughs> anybody tried it? Anybody tried online dating? What app? But, had, but at least had a couple dates, right? Tinder and OkCupid, okay and those are two of the biggest ones, right? And eHarmony, and there's so many of them. But even Tinder, which used to have this reputation for hookups, um, 
a lot of people on Tinder are looking for like real relationships now, but you just have to be very clear and upfront about that kind of stuff. Um, they're there. And this is not a bad way to explore. Um, but you do need to be really careful to use your internet safety skills, and you really do need to realize that an internet relationship, what level is an internet relationship on the pyramid? If you're looking, whoops, if you're looking at this pyramid, what level is internet? <laughs> in some ways you're here. If you really have a relationship online, you're here because you're in a structured environment, right? The computer dating site is a structured environment. So even though people are like, oh, I've met the love of my life, you really need to spend time together outside that structured environment. Now, you may quickly move through here. If you've got the right relationship online, you don't have to spend a ton of time getting here. I've seen several marriages off of it, and it can work. But to me, it seems a lot like blind dating, too. Blind dating, it either ends up really good or really bad. Worst dating experience of my life was a blind date, and I've I had several. Some of them weren't that bad, but this one was the worst. I was out with this girl. Nothing I said worked. Nothing was funny. She was not interested in anything that I was interested in. We were having a horrible date. The dinner was awful. I was trying to walk her back um, to the, to the uh, movie theater. We were going to go watch a movie. And we were actually with another couple because it was a blind date. And this truck pulls by, and she throws herself on the hood of this truck. And I'm like, okay, I knew it was a bad date. <laughs> but you're throwing yourself in front of a car, that's like pretty low. That's like a new low even for me. Turns out she knew the guy driving the truck and, and she just like gets in the cab with him and takes off, didn't even say goodbye. And thankfully it was so bad and it was a blind date, I didn't even know the girl very, I, I was able to laugh it off. But to me, internet dating seems very similar as I talk to people. It tends to go really bad or really good, but you know what, that's okay. All you need is one really good. It doesn't matter how many really bads you have, it's the one really good that counts, right? So anyway, online dating. It's worth trying if you think it can work for you. Um, don't get suckered into spending a bunch of money on it, though. Um, so let's say you've been dating, or let's say that at, you know, you're at a very high level of relationship and you're wondering about having sex. Here's a system that I teach my students to help them with these decisions, and it's in your handouts. Ask yourself, though, what level of the pyramid is this? What level should it be for a sexual relationship? Really dang high, right? Um, how long have I known this person? In what context? How old are they? Is this relationship healthy? Um, girl with autism I heard about, someone was telling me about where she, well, again, a little bit delayed, she graduated high school and she still was uh, hanging out with these guys in the drama club in the high school and so she sent a naked picture to one of these 15-year-old guys in the drama club. She's 18. Guess what happens? She goes to jail. Because, um, again, how old are they matters. Is a sexual relationship in line with my values? Is it in line with theirs? Am I looking for a real commitment or just a hookup, a one night stand? Is the other person interested in having sex or is it just me? Are they pressuring me? Am I pressuring them? What's their motive? And do I understand the consequences, physical and psychological, of having sex at this time with this person? And am I prepared to deal with those consequences? Now the cool thing about this system, it doesn't just work for sex, it works for any type of physical contact. So let's say you're in a relationship and you're like, should I hold hands, right, or should I kiss? Right? What pyramid level should it be if you're kissing people? It should be getting into that intimate friend, right? How long have I known this person? Is this a healthy relationship? Is kissing in line with my values? Is it in line with their values? Am I looking for a real commitment or just a makeout session? Is the other person interested in kissing? Are they pressuring me to kiss? Am I pressuring them? What's their motive? Do I understand the consequences of kissing at this time with this person and am I prepared to deal with it? It's the same system and it's a really good system and only you and your values can make the right choices here. Um, but just, just know you should have that. Once you start having sex, pregnancy is a possibility and you need to have systems to be ready for that. And you may want to consider being on birth control because having a child changes everything, even if you are married. Also, if you're sexually active, guess what? Over half of sexually active college-age youth have STDs in this country, according to the CDC and Stanford. Um, and nobody's using condoms, which if you are sexually active, you should definitely be doing that, right? Again, if you don't want to get pregnant and you don't want to get an STD, you should be probably not having sex. If you choose to have sex, all of this is in your handout. There are some definite steps to take to protect yourself at least as much as can be protected. Um, and realize this, even when you're in an appropriate sexual relationship, so let's say that you have the value that says, I need to be married to have sex, and let's say you're married and you want to have sex. 
Is, autism won't be a problem now, right? No, right? Sex has a lot of communication issues involved in it, and autism tends to be terrible with it. Emotion versus logic. Um, those of you who are in the nonverbal communication class and our sex ed teacher who is retired now was in there. She was our first sex ed teacher. Um, she used to tell our students, sex begins in the kitchen, she would tell the boys. And the boys are like, like, like on the table? And she's like, no, 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 no. What it means is you tell her, that was a delicious meal. And you say, wow, can I help you with these dishes, honey? And let me sweep that floor. And boy, you look cute today. And they were like taking notes. But that's the truth. Sex is very, very emotional, especially for females generally. But it's a very emotional thing. And it's not just, oh, well, we're married so we could be able to have sex. It's not just a logic thing. And the same with physicality versus intimacy. Um, you saw in the, in the clip from um, Autism and Love, Lindsay's trying to open up about why she wears jewelry and this insight she has to her soul and herself. And what time has she chosen to talk to Dave about it? Right when the weather's on and he's a meteorologist. So he's like, okay, well, let's watch the weather now. And she's like, you know, devastated. Um, our, our autistic fixations and our rigid routines can get in the way. Um, I've also met people with autism who they get really stuck on this person has to look a certain way. Okay, autistic couple I was talking to, the, husband, they've had, the wife has had five kids. They've been married almost 20 years. And he told her, you know, honey, you don't look like our wedding pictures anymore. And I mean, and the guy's like going bald and everything. But in his mind, he wants her to always look the same, right? I've met, talked to other couples where the wife is like, oh, he's so controlling. Because he won't even let me like, you know, and if, if I try to even just get a different hairdo or something, he gets so freaked out. He tells me how I have to have my hair. And I'm like, well, that's not trying to be controlling. That's just autism. We tend to want things to not change, but it can be an issue. Sensory issues. Sex has a lot of smell and touch issues. Um, there was a girl we were working with who she had gotten through some childhood abuse and everything, and she wanted to get married, and she's like, I've got this problem. I hate anything touching my palm. And so she's like, I can't even hold hands with this guy. We were able to help her figure out a way to minimize that, but... Social pausing is another one. Those of us with autism, when we start a relationship, we assume it's always where we left it, right? And so, you know, I told my wife I loved her. If it changed, I'd tell her, right? You know, I'm not, I don't need to tell her I love her again. Um, those are, of course, things I've learned to not, are not true as I've gone through 21 years of marriage now. But social pausing is a big deal. We tend to think that relationships stay stagnant and stay the same and stay exactly where we left them. What is the truth? Relationships are a living organism and we've got to constantly water it and care for it and feed it or it dies, right? Our social skills too, um, we have to get better and better at it. And that includes hygiene, that includes um, being able to talk about meaningful things. Other issues, as we're thinking about relationships, we got to ask ourselves, what's our values about marriage? If so, when do you get married? How long should you date? Do we want kids? How many? Who's going to take care of them? How are we going to pay for all this, right? A lot of people with autism, they've seen the Disney version and they're ready. I'm gonna go get married and live happily ever after uh, without a lot of communication and especially about heavy things are there. Um, you're setting yourself for failure. Also with autism, how many people in here really love little kids, babies and young children? I absolutely adore babies and young children, okay? Almost to a creepy level. <laughs> I'll come up to like total strangers and be like, oh, your child, it's like, it's not cool. How many people in here are the opposite side where they're like, little kids, I can't really handle them? Okay, where it's the sound and the smells and the unpredictability and the, just the general motion level. My youngest brother with autism, he can't even be around my kids because they're just too much. It's too loud. It's too many other things. He just does not like kids. As they've started to become teenagers, he's been like, hey, your kids are really cool. I want to hang with them. And they're like, I don't know, Uncle Shad. Why would I want to talk with him? Um, we're working on it. Bottom line, don't give up. I hope nothing I've said today discourages you. But you can and should have the relationships you want. And yes, you will have to build those social skills. Yes, you'll have to create systems and run them and modify them as necessary for dating and for dealing with anxiety and rejection. You'll have to be able to fail once in a while. You'll have to put in a lot of time and effort. You'll have to watch out for safety. You'll have to know your values. You'll have to try and keep those. But guess what? <laughs> Neurotypicals have to do the same dang thing, right? It may be a little harder for us. It may take us a little longer, but we absolutely can do all this. If neurotypicals can do it, we can too. And some of the most successful relationships I've ever seen are autistic relationships. Oftentimes where both spouses are autistic, oftentimes where one spouse is autistic and one isn't. It doesn't have to be a terrible thing. In fact, it can be absolutely great. Um, not too long after the, uh, 
the documentary, Dave and Lindsay Got Married, and they did a little follow-up where they interviewed them about their wedding. Listen to how they've evolved here and the systems that they're using to make this relationship work. See if you can point some out. The wedding went very smoothly overall, and Lindsay did a wonderful job in planning it with me as her assistant, and uh, the caring went well, and we had a, a lovely uh, 30 guest wedding with a few extras added for the reception. For the most part, it was pretty easy for me. There were times where I wanted to take a brief break from the action, and so I would just temporarily excuse myself and then come back. Uh, but at other times, uh, it's helpful to have a, like a canned response to when people are asking you, how's your day going, are you enjoying this, and have a standardized response. Um, but for the most part, uh, I thought it went well in that regard. I strategically tried to place an adequate amount of time before the wedding ceremony began where I just had the hotel room, uh, my own hotel room to myself. So I tried to schedule in those times when I could kind of have my solitude was a way that I was able to cope with the day, as well as just only inviting people that we um, you know, knew very, very well and were very close with and being very comfortable around. So it wasn't like we had anyone we didn't know at all. My own father even officiated our wedding. So trying to kind of make it so it was not, um, you know, having to worry about interacting with too many people that we were not very familiar with. For me, the hardest thing was narrowing down the list of 30 people, and um, it hurt me greatly to not be able to invite a lot of people who are, who are important to me in my life. So we did a secondary reception in Williamsburg as a, pretty much an extension of what we were doing here in D.C. Which was actually larger than the wedding itself. Yes. About twice as large. Yeah, that was my compromise. <laughs> Um, and Lindsay was a little nervous, especially um, with, at the end of both events, that when you're around a lot of people that um, you have to feel like you have to socialize with, that sometimes it can be a little difficult. Even for me sometimes, but especially for Lindsay, sometimes she just needs a break from it. It was um, very difficult for me. Yeah. But I was willing to, to yeah. do it for him. She survived. I survived to tell the tale. All right, so what are some of the systems you saw? What are some of the things that are really good signs for this couple and their relationships as they go forward as two autistic adults married? What are some positives? How are they making this work? Yeah. Good. Yes, even though those needs are totally different, right? Dave wants a big wedding with everybody there. She's like, I cannot handle that many people. And they're able to say, okay, let's figure out what can work. And so what did they do? What was their solution? Have a small wedding and then a big reception later. And yes, if she needed to get away, what was her system? When there was, she was getting overwhelmed with all the people, what was her system? She had a place. She had a hotel room she could retreat to. And what was his system for dealing with all these people? It's hard to hear him, but he talked about having a canned response, right? Thank you very much for coming to our wedding. We're really glad you could join us today. You know, again, it's not that hard even to come up with that script, but he had that system. And the bottom line is this. I mean, Dave and Lindsay are going to work because they communicate and they're creating systems. And you're going to be able to have the relationships you want if you're willing to communicate, you're willing to fail, and you're willing to keep going um, till you find the right people and the right person. Um, if you want more information, again, avoid internet searches. <laughs> there are, however, some carefully selected books, apps, and websites. Some of those are in your, in your handout. But have people you can talk to, a therapist, a doctor, a parent, a sibling, a, a clergy member, somebody you can talk to about this stuff, um, and you're going to be okay. Uh, you may think this is so super big and overwhelming, but at some point you'll be looking back and saying, I'm so glad that I had these experiences, made these choices, and I am where I am. Life is really enriching when we have all of these great relationships. And we can't control what the future is going to look like. But if we keep moving forward and keep building our skills, we're going to have whatever that best future is for us personally. And there's nothing about sex or relationships that needs to scare you. You can have all those relationships you want to have. So thank you very, very much. Uh, questions, comments? We've got, technically got 15 minutes left, but we don't need to take all that time. Yeah. Yeah. 
So this is a combination of a curriculum that we use here, although there's a lot more to the curriculum here because they do a full 15-week course here for every student required. Um, and then I just do like a two-hour crash course at UVU for the incoming freshmen with autism. And this is very similar to that curriculum. Mm -hmm. Incoming autistic freshmen are part of the Passages program at UVU and that I helped develop. Everybody should use it. I, honestly, that's what I hear. Like, so we always have like, people in the class who are neurotypicals that are volunteering to help. And they're always like, oh, I wish I had this class when I was a freshman at college. Yeah. No, please. It can't hurt, right? I mean, again, the bottom line is that you want the person themselves to eventually be able to come up with their own systems and to reinforce those systems and follow them. But especially at first, it's a great idea to have somebody help you with the system. Or if your system's not working, then that's a great idea to be able to have somebody to bounce it off and be like, why didn't this work? I did all these things and I showed up to her house with a, with a limo and, a, and chocolates and flowers and all the things and she doesn't want to talk to me anymore. It's good to have someone that you can then talk to those systems. <laughs> How did, I, again, I had my system for asking people out. But when you were younger, people didn't have that system. No, we didn't. But so, long, long story short, those of you who've seen me do like. They, they do get to know a lot of stuff. You need to create systems. Um, when I was in junior high, I had an autism crash and I dropped out of school. And you're not technically allowed to drop out of school at 12 years old, but I was not going back because we can be a little bit stubborn, those of us with autism. And I stayed at home and I did correspondence classes because that's what they would let me do. And I never wanted to go back to school again. And I would hang out at the library for fun and go through the discard bin and, and get books that way because I was really poor. But um, one of the books that was in the discard bin one day was Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. And it was the first book I'd ever read that was about, yeah, you've seen the book. It was... It was, it was about social <laughs> systems, right? And it was one of the first books ever written about social systems. And I was like, and it didn't use the word systems, but he went through all of these very explicit social techniques. And I was like, I could do this. So I tried some of it out at my local church congregation where I was like, okay, so his system was, you walk up to the person, you greet them by name, look them in the eye, shake their hands and smile. And that's the system for like building rapport. I'm like, well, okay, that won't work at school, but it will work at church. So I tried it at church. I'd never bothered to learn anybody's name at church before because why? Why would I want to know this? So, but I started going up and I'd be like, why, hello, sister so-and-so, and I'd smile and shake their hand and look them in the eye. And within about a month of doing this, everybody was telling my parents like, oh my gosh, Jared is just such a gentleman. He's such a good young man. He's doing all, and I was getting all this great social feedback and I was like, okay, this, this, this is good stuff. So I took my, my how to win friends and influence people and started trying to apply that to high school. And I went back to school because I knew I needed to go to college because I suck at anything manual. And so, I was like, crud, I gotta go to college and I'm gonna need systems to make it through high school. And it wasn't perfect and I had a lot of ups and downs, but I eventually was able to learn enough social skills there. And then I'm LDS and I went on an LDS mission to Japan, the land of autism, which is a wonderful place to go if you have autism. And they have very, very rigid structural constructs there, which was nice. And they gave me what was called the commitment pattern, which was another social skills system about getting people to agree to do things. So I came back off my mission and just used that to invite girls on dates, and it worked really, really well. Um, and thank you, motivational interviewing, yes. And it worked really, really well. And then I, I found that, eventually I found the right person. One of the things that shocked me is I always thought I was gonna feel horribly nervous around people, especially girls. And because every girl I'd ever dated, it was just constant stress and pressure. And when I finally met the girl I eventually married, it was fascinating because from the time we first started talking, I felt really relaxed around her. And I really felt like I could kind of be myself with her, which of course has turned out to be a really good thing being married for 21 years. But, um, but honestly, those systems are there and you can apply them. And there's more and more helps than ever, like you were saying now. There are so many systems now for social skills because even the neurotypicals, they're terrible at social skills now, right? Because all of their social interaction is on their phone and they're like texting this person and texting that person and they don't know how to have a, how to have a face to face conversation. One of the other things that worked for me is I didn't know any of the social rules. So like I would ask girls out that like, oh, you can't ask out so and so. And so nobody ever asked her out. So she was like desperate to go on a date. So she's like, yeah, sure, I'll go with you. Or I'd ask out the girl that didn't fit the mold that all the other guys were looking for because I knew it was an easy date and it was great and I'd get a lot of experience and a lot of good friends. 
and a lot of free cookies and stuff. It was great. And so there's, a, there's all of those opportunities are there. Um, but you need systems. You need systems for that. And then you need continually to have systems, communication systems in particular, as that relationship advances. At what point should you disclose your autism in the relationship? When you feel comfortable doing so is a pretty good answer. There's no right or wrong. There's no right or wrong. I would generally say by the third date, you probably should say something. Um, but again, there's no right or wrong. What you don't want to do is get married and then spring it on them. Okay. I didn't have a choice. I wasn't diagnosed yet. But she at least knew what she was getting into when we got married. And even after we got married, there were things I had not anticipated. Our first fight was because my wife, who is the world's most wonderful woman, put the toilet paper on the roll so it comes off the bottom. I know, like this is a cardinal sin. She had, I don't know how my wife, who is the world's greatest person, could be this wrong about something. And so we had to have talks about, and finally I realized that like, wait a minute, I'm just glad she's changing the toilet paper roll at all. This is stupid. So I would just say, thanks for changing the toilet paper roll and take two seconds and flip it over and that saved me a fight. And to this day, she still puts the toilet paper on and doesn't care whether it comes off the top or the bottom. I can't believe this woman. And yet, it's okay, we've been able to deal with that. Um, I would come in from the outside. Utah's a little bit warm. I'm not used to that. It would be like 100 degrees outside. I'd come into the air conditioned department and that change in temperature was physically painful for me. And so if I was being touched at that point, it would hurt. And so I'd walk in the door and what does my wife want to do? Oh, welcome back from work. Give me a big hug, right? And I would just be like, ugh. Which by the way, this is not a nonverbal you want to give your spouse when you're first married. Okay, um, it says, I don't want to be near you. Uh, so we were able to talk it through, and I didn't have the word autism, but I was able to say, oh, I'm really sensitive to temperature changes. Maybe it's because I'm from Alaska, and, but I just, I need to be able to reacclimate, and then I'll come find you and give you a hug. And that worked out great. Bottom line is this, if you have the right communication and you're willing to keep talking about the really tough things, like toilet paper, you can have a great relationship too. You guys have been awesome. Thank you for being an OtCon today. If you're going to join us for the movie, please make sure you, you come see us. If not, um, we'll hopefully see you next year. Thank you so much. And let me know if you have any questions.